Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 78 of Sports Shorts. I'm Bobby Hacker, the Sports Shorts guy, your host, and I'm very pleased to announce our guest today is DeMarie Smith, the former executive director of the NFL Players Association, and now, I think, a law school lecturer. Welcome, Dee. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I'm actually sitting in my Pepperdine office. Well, that's interesting. And we're going to get to that in a minute because I, I know a little about your course and I want to talk about that. But for starters, the way we like to get our, our program going is to talk about what you're doing, what your sort of job is or what you're doing these days and talk about your path. And I think most interesting, the path that found you as the head of a labor union. Yeah, I mean that's a that's an interesting trajectory, right? Um, uh, I started off my career as a homicide prosecutor at the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. From there, I became the counsel to then Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder, and then I became a partner at Latham and Watkins, partner at uh, Patton Boggs. And the only way I know how to tell the story is the truth. I got a cold call from a search firm that uh, was looking for the next executive director of the NFL Players Association. And uh, I responded to that by saying that was the goofiest thing that um, <laughs> I'd ever heard. I'd never represented any at professional athlete never been an agent, never played the game. And I don't know, five meetings and a contested election between two former NFL PA presidents later and uh, 15 years and I'm in the job. Well, that's, that's interesting. And, and what's most interesting is the fact that uh, I think at the time you got the call, you were actually working on the uh, presidential transition team for President Obama uh, after having done major litigation and all of a sudden you get a call that says, hey, would you like to run a labor union? I mean, that's, that's one of those out of left field things, but also one of those moments where it pays not to go through life with blinders on. 100%. And um, that call came at a time when I was working on the Justice Department transition team and my only wish was to go back to the U.S. Uh, attorney's office as the U.S. attorney. And um, I started talking to this group of players about a fight with the owners where they wanted the players to give back 20% of their salaries, give up their pensions, play 18 games for free. And uh, that conversation turned into an epic 15 years. Well, I think it also, I think it also sort of brought brought to mind when you're thinking about what happened, is you were faced with something where there was clearly, <laughs> you walked into what was pretty much an inequitable labor negotiation, yeah. and with no experience, a right thinking man would have to have a WTF moment, <laughs> and and suddenly go, wait, the sport is growing. Media rights deals are increasing, but the owners want to give the players less. Right. Um, that would be one of those gobsmacked moments, I would think, for any reasonable person. But you walked into a firestorm with no background and no real transition, correct? Yeah. Yeah. The, the worst part of that was I, I never got an opportunity to meet or learn from Gene Upshaw. He had already passed. And to, to your point, that was a stark example of the bald face of power. And it wasn't that the players are working any less. It wasn't that the sport was making less. It was just simply a group of really greedy owners who decided to make a land grab. And that land grab, I'm, I'm sure they thought of it as the, the, the power of the union was gone. 
the man who had negotiated the last four collective bargaining agreements was gone. And this was a great opportunity to take advantage of the players. And so, you know, you're right. It's a gobsmack moment. But when you look back at, at what I had done over the last 10, 10, 12 years in private practice, I, I'd represented some of the biggest countries in the world, uh, companies in the world. Um, I was used to bet the company litigation. Um, thankfully, Tom Boggs taught me how Washington worked <laughs> and, and how to offset the levels of, of power. And, and my message to the players was a really simple one. We need to have a game plan that destabilizes the owner's power. And we have to use this CBA to really maintain the integrity of the union. And that was the fight. And it's also, you know, messaging because the players, it would seem, had been pretty comfortable because Gene had been around a long time. You know, there's, there is always, in any negotiation, someone's got to say, we could have done better. Why didn't we get? But you end up with the deal you end up with. And it would seem to me that the new guy, you're the new kid in, on the block, and you roll in and the players have to be going, you know, what, does this guy have the relationship? Can he get a deal done? How did you assuage those concerns with the players? I told them that this deal was not about relationships. You know, whatever Paul and Gene and that relationship, that was over. Paul is gone, Gene is gone, and I don't know what type of relationship you need to have when somebody wants you to play two extra games for free, give up your pension, and give back 20% of your salary. I mean, I mean my, yeah. my message to the players was pretty simple. Do you really think that we're going to hug this one out? <laughs> and the owners had made it clear that they had four billion dollars to lock out the players. Um, I told the players we needed to have a strategy to freeze that four billion dollars. As the world now knows, we bought a secret insurance policy uh, to pay the players in the event that the lockout goes. An, an entire year. And so from a game strategy standpoint, you know the owners, based on the history, they believe the players are going to fold somewhere between week four and week seven. And, and that's a reality. The insurance policy made it clear that the players we're going to last an entire season of no football. And, and by the way, after that, they would get the players, they would get me. And, but we also convinced Judge Doty at the time that their $4 billion that they got from the networks likely violated the 2006 CBA. And now that money is in question. And so, you know, we didn't tell anybody about the insurance policy. We negotiated, I think, through July. And the only remaining things on the table were, uh, I believe, 18 games. Uh, and, and how much money you know, that, that was at stake. And we waited and sprung the insurance policy on the <laughs> owners at the last minute. And they realized that whatever game strategy they had probably wasn't going to play out in reality. And most importantly, the players got back, uh, or for the first time, the ability to control the amount of work they were going to do. Because up until that point, under the 2006 deal, I think the owners had the ability to go up to 21 games unilaterally. So, you know, did we get everything we wanted out of bargaining? No. Did the owners get everything they wanted out of bargaining? No. 
Well, but to put a frame on it, in 2020, the league, you know, agrees to a deal that includes a 17th game that conservatively is going to net players somewhere between one point three and one point eight billion dollars. And they had that game for free in twenty eleven. Yeah. Well I think when we talk about negotiation and call it an art, call it what you will, but when when we were together a week or so ago and it's I've been thinking about this a lot, and you mentioned it now, is the concept of game theory and how you apply game theory to a negotiation. And I think it's really important, and, and it's something that law students most often aren't or go ever going to hear in law school. And I think a lot of pr practitioners don't think in those terms, but I'd love it if you could just talk a little bit about that as a negotiation strategy. Well, yeah, because... I one of the things you read in the negotiation books is th this idea of find win-win. Where's there a mutuality between the parties? But for the most part, all of the negotiation books or strategies envision a finite game. There's going to be this contract. It's going to last for this long. It's between these two parties, and then there will be a new thing later on. Well, and, and for our game strategy and the way that I looked at 2011, it was an infinite game, and the owners had no interest in engaging in fair bargaining because they thought that if they locked the players out, they would get whatever they wanted without really having a fair bargaining deal. So, you know, the way that I would talk to the players about it is, and it's a little bit of a rough analogy, but if you're in an alley and somebody comes at you with a gun and says, I want your money, that's a negotiation. It just happens to be a terrible one. <laughs> Awful. If you're able to come into the alley and match that level of power, it's a different negotiation. So it has nothing to do with relationships. Jerry Jones was never going to come to a point where out of the love of his heart, he was going to back off on his objective. Jerry Richardson was not going to back off. And Robert Kraft was not going to back off because he likes D. <laughs> <laughs> These are not people who have achieved their status or their wealth based on like or relationship. They will either um, respect power and how it relates to their power and they just want to have a negotiation that works out in, in a way that's the best for them. But to get to the point, I really resented the bold power move of not wanting to even engage in fair bargaining. You know, and, and we now know through the lens of history that the 2006 deal had this uncapped year. And the idea was, well, the pox on the owner's house is that it's gonna be un uncapped and teams can spend wildly and that will incentivize them to get a deal done. And, and the pox on the players was there was gonna be no benefits in the uncapped year and that would incentivize them to get a deal done. The only problem is the owners cheated. They had a secret agreement during the uncapped year in order to keep wild spending under control. And we know that because later on, they took salary cap money away from the Cowboys and the, and the Washington team at the time. 
but they literally cheated their own deal. <laughs> I mean, who, the only people I know of, okay, there's two people I know of, <laughs> who actively don't care about the terms of the deal at the moment they signed it <laughs> is the NFL. The other one is the former president, but you know. Yeah, well, <laughs> I could read between the lines on that one. Uh, but so this this raises to me another question, or perhaps it's more of, of a lesson for people negotiating, which is you have to think beyond the simple proposition of I have something that you want to obtain and you want to obtain my services. You know, that's a, a bargain to be made. But that's an ideal. That's, you know, Correct. the allegory of the cave stuff. That's not reality. I think we get to a place where what we're talking about is, well, who is on the side of the table and what are their goals and are their goals independent of any ethical foundation? I, I, that's maybe an extreme way to say it, but I think that's part of what we have to look at in negotiating deals. Well, the fir first thing I have to say is any man that refers to Plato's cave is a man after my own heart. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you're absolutely right. It's, it's never, a, at least in these cases, it's never binary. And it's also never exactly what it seems or appears, which, you know, as you and I have talked, which frustrates us but especially the media, they tend to just boil things down into these utterly simplistic binary assumptions that have no bearing in reality. And, and by the way, if I thought that you were more ethical than me, am I not incentivized to be more unethical? <laughs> in order to get the benefit of the bargain. And if I try to convince you that we're dealing with a binary issue and it's actually a multifaceted issue where all these things are going on behind your back and behind the, the, the nature of the deal, you lose. So... In dealing with the NFL all those years and, th you know, some labor deals that had to be, some bargaining agreements that had to be accomplished, do you feel over time that the relationship dynamic changed between you and the commissioner, for example? I, I mean, was there, was there finally an understanding of that? You know, people always used to say, well, Paul and Gene were, you know, like too close. I mean, they got a deal done that people at the time were happy with, but you know, that always struck me as an odd statement. And obviously, 100%. Paul and Roger are completely different people in every aspect. Well, well I, I, people, and I, I, I heard that over and over, Paul and Gene were too close. And, and frankly, I think that that is a sophomoric analysis of the relationship perpetuated by the media. Here's what I know. When the union decertified and was fighting for free agency between 1971 and 1993, Gene was a part of the union. Paul was a part of the league that actually facilitated money going to players in the quarterbacks club to remove those players from their union. At almost every one of those trials over free agency, culminating in the Freeman McNeil trial, Gene Upshaw was cross-examined by Paul Tagliabue. I've cross-examined hundreds of people. We are not friends. 
And this idea that, that there was some lore and this and that, no. I mean, the deal that Gene and Paul cut was violated by the owners in 2010. And he knew that the 2011, once it exp expired, was going to be a war. And Gene started preparing for war when he died. So I, I just think that we try to oversimplify it. And certainly people who've never done a lick of collective bargaining <laughs> or negotiations um, like to sit back and they have these wonderful Pollyanna-ish theories of, well, if you can just get a relationship with these people and if, if they understand that there's win-wins, there's only one National Football League and they have put every startup league out of business because they are ruthless. So I look at it and I try to convince the players of two things. Every millionaire billionaire that has tried to even get a toehold in the football market since the 70s has gone out of business. And those were millionaires and billionaires. And every NFL player comes to a point in their career where they have to negotiate with a GM and they try to get a new contract. And almost no player has held out effectively to, to change their bargaining position. Almost none. So what you end up with is these two forces that have to engage each other's power. And, and over time, do I think we got to a point in the league where we respected each other's power? I think that answer is yes. Um, you look at the, 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 the growth of neutral arbitration from 2009 until 2020. When I came into the job, the players only had neutral arbitration for one category of cases. By the time, even before we got to the 2020 deal, we had neutral arbitration for everything except um, personal conduct. And by the way, those were gains by the players during a collective bargaining agreement. But by the way, we only got there because every time we believed that they violated the CBA, we sued them to the death. <laughs> and, and the point is, you don't always win. But I, I think even Roger got to a point where he was like, neutral arbitration is better for both sides. Well, I think the, the difference is in the dynamic of a negotiation is when you know the other side's not going not gonna to cave. You know, you can't have a complete standoff or the business is going to stop. Owners learn that you're not going to effectively lock the players out because they're going to have a strategy to prevent them. And it becomes a very gr huge chess game. And as I said to you a week or so ago, it's a crazy chess game when both, both players decide they're going to sacrifice their queen in the first five moves. And then you have right. a very different dynamic and you have to begin to sort out how are we going to get through this because the numbers keep growing. They grow. They obviously have grown for the league itself and the owners. But by the same token, the share of the players are getting, the actual cash dollars increased to the players are increasing. And the fact that we've gotten to a point where there's actually, God, I can't believe I'm going to say this word, guaranteed money. Right. Because there was right. a long time where the NFL would not allow guarantee, any kind of guaranteed contracts. 
that is a sea change. But I think maybe that's part of the understanding that you, the player, the, these owners need the players. Fans aren't going to show up to watch something other than the best players in the world. Well, well, and also you you think about um, how the players over the last fifteen years have utilized the structure of the CBA to make their player contracts better, right? So, I mean, we, we every, every person in the media, I always have a ridiculous conversation about the franchise. When I came in in, the, in 2009, 2000, you know, 2010, I mean, we're talking about dozens, dozens of players were getting franchised, right? We changed the rule in 2011 about the franchise tag in two important ways. First, your salary was the average of the top five at your position. And then if you got franchised a second time, it was the average of the top three. So now the price tag of that, that, that franchise tag is so high that owners are like, maybe I don't want to pay it. But equally important, those franchise tags became fully guaranteed at the moment of signing. So then an enterprising quarterback, like like Kirk Cousins, once he goes into the free market, he's now been franchised twice. The CBA means it's a really big number. And the CBA also means it's fully guaranteed. So why would you take a contract that is structured in a worse way in the free market than the contract you had that was structured under the CBA as a result of collective bargaining? And lo and behold, he becomes the first player in modern day history to get a fully guaranteed contract. Now, you know, I would have expected that that number would have increased exponentially uh, because no CBA guarantees contracts. It's a matter of custom. But that didn't happen. And and as you now know, I mean, we did sue the league over guaranteed contracts before I left um, on a on a theory that there's been collusion. Well, some people call it theory. Other people call it fact. <laughs> I was trying to be polite. <laughs> well, I have one more one more question about your your tenure with the PA, and then a, a quick jump to what's what your your class, if you if you don't mind. But sure. One of the issues that really has always struck me and is sort of touches me personally in a lot of ways is the health and safety issues. Yeah, and you know, what went on with the denial that there's such a thing as CTE yeah. or there's such a, you know, that the game is safe and helmets are safe. And that's always seemed to be a big challenge on both sides with the players going like, we want to protect our health and well-being and the owner seemingly paying lip service to it and not, I mean, that seems the more difficult issue than even money on some levels. Well, and it's a great segue, you know, to my my class, right? I, my class is leadership, law, and ethics in sport, and and that, you know, that sort of seminal moment in, in player health and safety. Um, in two thousand nine, when I took the job, the head of the league's concussion committee was a rheumatologist. <laughs> I mean, it's the best and worst punchline of every joke in the NFL that I could ever tell, right? And health and safety for the players wasn't even a major topic of bargaining that the, that the owners even considered heading into the lockout. It became an issue because the players cared about the issue. And, and you know, in, in 2010, we uh, convinced Congress to hold hearings on concussions. That conversation of the league uh, 
suppressing Dr. Amalu's studies is a real one. And the the articles that that are now in the collective bargaining agreement and all of the health and safety structures um, that we talk about now, none of those existed prior to. Uh, I mean, my guess is every student in my class had a baseline concussion examination when they were in high school. There were no baselines in the pros. The idea that there is a return to play protocol, that there is going to be an independent person that certifies that you are now ready to come back from a, from a concussion. You know, beyond spotters up in the in the in the in the at the part of the stadium, sideline concussion experts um, certifying the criteria and the qualifications of team doctors didn't exist. So you know this this idea of making humanity matter became really important to me and really important. Well, I think it's, it's an, it's, it's, you know, it's been difficult for a long time as it's come out, you know, well, what happened to this guy? What was the problem? You know, and everybody said, oh, he was a drunk, you know, he was doing drugs. And I think it's only in the last maybe 10 years that people are realizing this guy had a traumatic brain injury sure. and it's changed the perception. And, you know, I am personally disappointed that my governor here in California, who I generally support, wouldn't sign the no tackle under 14 law. I think, you know, there are, there are ways that you can help make, a, make awareness. And Rob yep. Gronkowski just came out and said, you shouldn't play tackle before you're 14. Play flag football. You learn all the yep. skills. You can develop everything. And that's a huge change from the, you know, I'm an NFL guy. I'm tough. I'm so tough. Nothing matters. And I think that has changed. And I think the public appreciates that. Yeah, I, I hope so. And, and, but, but we also, to your point, needed to change the culture, even on our side of the table. Right. And, and I remember going from team to team talking about we, the necessity of concussion protocols and getting this pushback from players. Well, gee, I'm a gladiator. I signed up for this. <laughs> I know what the dangers are. I understand the risk. And, and, and what I would say to him back is, first of all, did you accept the risk? In, in over 100 years of NFL football, you know what's never existed? What's that? A waiver signed by the players. Ever. Think about that for a second. And so what I would do is I would pick up a helmet in, in, the, in the locker room, turn it on its back, and there's a sticker on the back of that, whether it's Riddell or Shut or somebody else. And that sticker says the boilerplate language of whatever waiver that they think is going to be important. And you and I as lawyers might question whether this waiver is valid or an adhesion contract or whatever. But my point was, Riddell and these makers of all of this equipment stamp a waiver on everything that you wear. And yet, for some reason, <laughs> the National Football League has never asked for a waiver of players. So have you really accepted the risk? Answer is no. Second. Even today, we know less about CTE and concussions than we need to know. It's 2024. <laughs> and, well, and, and, yeah, so, and, then, and then the last thing is this idea that you're a gladiator, a gladiator in the Roman Colosseum <laughs> was less of a person than the person in the stands. 
so, significantly yeah. less of a person. Not even, maybe not even a person. Not even a person. So you're not a gladiator. You don't know the risk, and you've assumed nothing. And by the way, isn't there just a safer way for us to do this? And, you know, for example, I remember the battle over uh, eliminating two-a-day practices. And I remember the first day we sat in the negotiation room with the owners, having looked at film and, and, and analysis by neurophysicians, and they came up with a number, and I forget what it was. It was either, I mean, it was in the tens of thousands. We can eliminate tens of thousands of head to head, head to knee, head to ground, subconcussive events by eliminating one practice in preseason. And owners, their brilliant response to this, well, D, we've always done two days. How about we not? <laughs> <laughs> that that's like the classic uh, famous story about Ralph Nader doing one of his first trials and the other lawyer goes, well, you know, this is how we've always done it. And Nader went, well, it doesn't mean you've done it the right way. And and that's the reality. You can't just again, that's a view of life with blinders on this work. This is going to work. But things change. It's not a static universe we live in. It's dynamic. And you have to understand those changes and you have to live with and work through them. A hundred percent. And and you look at one simple fact. We dramatically changed the health and safety regime in football. And the only thing that's resulted is football is still 85 of the top 100 shows. And next every, year, they every will hit year. the $23 billion mark. And, and so, you know, the transition to my class is, okay, if we have this regime in professional football, how come we don't have this regime <laughs> in college football? Same neuroscientist, same coaches, same lawyers, but yet college athletes do not have the same protection that we have in the pros. Can't be a difference of knowledge. It's a difference of power. And on the difference of power, Dartmouth basketball players just yeah. were certified and Dartmouth has said, we're not going to negotiate with them. It's Correct. an interesting, interesting perspective for management to say that we're going to ignore the existence of the National Labor Relations Act, but I guess there's going to be some litigators that are going to be jumping into this big time. And but it's it's the kind of change, and you know, let's just see where it goes. That's all we can do right now. Well, 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 and think about the perspective of the athletes that. Dartmouth, uh, and we just covered this today in class, so it's perfect. Dartmouth has an endowment of $8 billion. They just completed a $3.4 billion capital raise. They have 4,500 students. And across Dartmouth, whether it's other employees, food service employees, other workers, they are fully unionized. And they just increased their workers' salaries $5 an hour through collective bargaining. And here is one of America's Ivy League schools that prides itself on bringing in and developing America's next leaders and they've made a decision that you are not worthy of even being bargained with what 
what's this? I mean, either you believe that you're recruiting the best and the brightest to then put out into the world to help lead, lead the world. And you've made a decision that while they're there, because they're an athlete, you're not worthy to be bargained with. So what did they do? They hired the same lawyers that represent Amazon, Starbucks, and they turned them loose to fight a group of college kids. Shame on them. Shame on them. I guess it's one of those moments where... Yeah, it's... It's a... It's a, it's a crazy situation. Look, I, I, we've gone over what I, the time, but it's just such a pleasure chatting with you and, and, and listening to you talk about, you know, the wars you fought through. Uh, and now you're a law school professor. And I'm sure you'll be teaching this class somewhere uh, for a long time. Yeah. I think it's the kind of, kind of course that law students really need to have. And I think uh, I think we're gonna see some uh, D. Smith books coming out in a while. Yeah, maybe, just maybe, think, you know, just maybe, just maybe. I think there might be a little story or two to tell, and I think people will know that it will be unabridged. Yeah, <laughs> it will be completely unabridged, or as my wife would say, <laughs> unhinged. <laughs> well, nothing unhinged about you, my friend. Thank D. You. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Really a pleasure uh, uh, hearing these stories and, and the perspective on, on so many levels. And for those of you out there, this is, we are the Sports Lawyers Association. And please go to sportslaw.org and join or renew your membership because we're on an annual membership program and your membership expired December 31st. And you, you'll note that we, we've now put out the list of our conference this May in Baltimore. And I hope you can attend and also our mid-year symposium, which will be in New Orleans in November. So we'll see you all soon. And Dee, I'll see you soon. And thanks very much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, my friend. And I'll see you, see you there. All right. Bye-bye.